Welcome back. Um, in the last lecture, we were discussing about uh, the behavior of the characters on of a fi finite abelian group. So, in our setting G, a finite abelian group. G hat, this is the dual of G, which is the set of all characters on G. Gamma of x plus y is equal to gamma x into gamma y. And then we had given the notation C G to be the set of all functions, complex valued functions on G. Then what we have shown that the number of elements in G hat is same as number of elements in G and uh, uh, if number of elements of then then uh, let us say gamma i, i from 0 to n minus of 1, this um, are all the characters of G and they form an orthonormal basis for C G with this inner product f comma G is equal to 1 over mod over G summation over x belongs to g, f of x, g of x bar. Now, so if f is in c g, then we define Fourier coefficient or Fourier coefficient of f as f hat at gamma, this is equal to 1 by the cardinality of g x varies over g f of x gamma of x bar for gamma belongs to g hat. This is what it is called the Fourier. Uh, coefficient and the Fourier series of f is summation over gamma varies over g hat f hat gamma then gamma of x that is what the Fourier series is. What is the inversion formula says? Now we need so inversion formula from our previous experience, we would expect that f of x is equal to gamma over where is over g hat f and gamma, gamma of x, this is for all x belongs to g and f in c of g. So, this is what we would like to prove. Now, first let us see f is in c g. and g hat forms an orthonormal basis for c g. Therefore, thus as g hat and o n b for c of g, therefore, f of x this is equal to summation over gamma belongs to g hat alpha of gamma 
and gamma of x this is true for all x belongs to g for some alpha gamma belongs uh, complex number scalar because it is going to be the linear combination of uh, all those gammas in g it is a basis now i take an eta belongs to g hat then f of eta this is equal to summation gamma belongs to g hat alpha gamma gamma dot and eta. So, this is it is a finite sum. So, we can pull out the sum and then this is also we can pull out alpha gamma then this is gamma inner product of eta. Now, we know that they satisfy the orthogonal properties the characters therefore, this is going to survive only when gamma is equal to eta. So, this is so and what is our f of eta this is 1 over mod g summation over x varies over g f of x eta x bar this is nothing but f hat at eta. So, thus f is equal to summation over alpha eta is equal to f hat at eta for every eta belongs to g hat. Therefore, this is gamma varies over g hat, this is f hat of gamma, gamma of x that is what is called the Fourier inversion. So, we have got the Fourier inversion. Now, another important thing in the Fourier series course is to get the Percival identity or the Planserol theorem. So, so this is uh, PT or Planserol formula. Okay. So, now as we recall for the uh, Fourier uh, series case, series case we got that this is 1 over 2 pi 0 to 2 pi mod of f of x square dx this is equal to summation over n mod of f hat of n square that is in the Fourier series and uh, so this we call as the norm of f square and for the case of j d n what we have got similarly the norm of f square this is equal to summation over uh, n is equal to 1 uh, 0 to n minus 1 mod of f hat of n square rather there we have denoted f at as capital of n. Okay. So, here also we would like to get the similar thing uh, that was all happening because of the orthogonal relationship of the characters in both the setting and now we have the orthogonality relation. So, hence uh, we can have let us start with which is by definition. So, now this is equal to summation over gamma varies over g hat by inversion formula f hat of gamma gamma and summation over eta varies over g hat f hat of eta 
eta. So, now all these are finite sum. So, we pull this out. This is gamma belongs to g hat, eta belongs to g hat and f hat gamma is independent of x. So, this is and on the from the second coordinate if we are taking f hat of gamma this will appear with a bar conjugate of this. So, this is gamma eta. Now, if I do perform the eta integral first, a eta uh, sum first, then this sum this quantity is going to survive only when gamma is equal to eta. So, this becomes gamma belongs to g hat. Now, f hat of gamma. Now, eta has to be and then gamma gamma is 1. So, this is nothing but So, that is what we have also we derive uh, the Percival identity or the plans roll theorem for a finite abelian group. So, just to put it on record we write that the theorem inversion and plans roll holds for finite abelian group. Okay, so, successfully we could derive the basic facts about the Fourier analysis in the setting of uh, finite abelian group. So, it is a natural question that one would like to ask at this stage that what are the other uh, setting in which we can extend this theory of Fourier series. So, before come addressing that issue let us uh, see some uh, use of this uh, Fourier analysis on finite abelian group in number theory. So, basically uh, I, I will not give the entire proof in glory details of all the results what I, I am going to state. Um, however, I mean I would try to sketch and give the outline as well as uh, uh, pointing out what are the difficulties, but just to uh, give an appropriate direction in which uh, uh, you can proceed further on your own. Okay, so, now let us talk about little number theory with the elementary number theory. So, what we know is that one of the first thing we know that if n is n belongs to n then it has prime factorization and also this is unique that all of us we uh, uh, have learned uh, at a very early stage just to a quick recall that uh, if uh, if we do not have so suppose this is not true then we must arrive at a contradiction and that is that you take the set S which is equal to set of all n belongs to n such that n does not have 
have prime factorization then what we are assuming suppose s is non empty then what you can do is that it is a subset of the natural number. So, it will always have a least element. So, now let n naught be the least element of s. Now, certainly n naught cannot be a prime if it is a prime it has a prime factorization. So, it has to be a composite number. So, now uh, n naught would be a into b where both a and b they are greater than 1 a is greater than 1 and b is greater than 1. Now, both of them are less than n naught. Now, if they have prime factorization then both a and b they have prime factorization then n naught will have prime factorization. So, if a and b have prime factorization then n naught also has prime factorization but which is a contradiction you are assuming that a and b uh, a, a not uh, uh, does not have a prime factorization because it belongs to s. Now, if they do not have notice that a and b they are less than n naught. Now, they do not have prime factorization. So, they have every right to be the element member of s, but n naught is the least Therefore, that again a contradiction. So, if they do not have prime factorization, then uh, a belongs to s which is a contradiction as n naught is the least. So, now every integer will have prime factorization that is what uh, oh, this is the proof which we are all aware of and now the uniqueness I mean that is also uh, kind of uh, 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 easy. Suppose uh, there are 2 p 1 to p r and q 1 to q s. There are 2 prime factorization, 2 prime factorization. Then definitely p 1 is going to divide some of the q i, but q i is a prime. So, it cannot be divisible by any other number. So, p 1 has to be q i. Similarly, you take out now p 1 if you take out and i you have taken out from the right hand side you have uh, p 2 to p r is equal to q product of q 1 to q s without i without q i. Then the same argument p 2 you take it is going to divide some prime and the, the other side is a prime therefore, it has to be same. So, what you will get that this is the unique. So, this is unique factorization. Anyway, so this uh, we know it uh, well. So, now of course, at a very uh, early stage in our school, we learn that uh, the number of primes they are infinite. That is the Euclid's uh, argument that uh, prime are infinite that is simple if not 
let p 1 to p n be primes be only primes and uh, p n is the largest. Okay. So, therefore, cons consider this number, this is what Euclid said p 1 into p 2 into p n plus 1. Now, this is a natural number p is in n and then this p is going to have prime factorization. So, now if and we have only primes at our hand is only p 1 to p n. So, now you can see that p is not divisible by p 1, p 1 does not divide p or p i does not divide for i is equal to 1 to n. Therefore, all the existing prime what we are assuming to have at our disposal, none of them is going to divide p. Therefore, p has to be a prime. So, p is a prime p is a prime, uh, but p is bigger than p n, which is again a contradiction. So, that we are familiar from our school days, there are infinitely many primes. Now, it is uh, except for p uh, 2, all the primes are odd. So, there are infinite number of odd primes. So, now the odd prime they can be divided into two disjoint uh, sets that means either if p is a prime then p either belongs to 4 n plus 1 that means p is of the form 4 k plus 1 for some k or p belongs to 4 n plus 3. So, so I will denote 4 n plus a is equal to 4 k plus a such that k varies over n. That is what the notation we are following. So, so one of them because they are which is odd p is an odd prime let us write odd prime then either this belongs to this. So, natural to ask is both 4 k plus 1 uh, rather 4 n plus 1 and 4 n plus 3 contains infinitely many primes or one of them contain finitely many prime. Because simple logic says that if there are infinitely many primes, then uh, obviously uh, one of them has to contain infinitely many primes. So, now it can happen that one of them contain only finitely many prime or the one is contains infinitely or both contains infinitely many prime. So, first let us look at 4 n plus 3 and let us play the game Euclid had given us. So, suppose 4 n plus 3 contains 
finitely many primes say p1 to pn and pn is the largest. Now, you consider 4 product of i from 1 to n p i plus 3. Now, obviously, p belongs to n. So, this is going to have prime factorization. Now, whatever the prime factorization is that p is equal to q 1 to some q s prime factorization. Now, obviously, as we can see that if uh, q any q i, they cannot be of the form does not belongs to 4 n plus 3, because it is it will be one of this p, p 1 to p n and this is going to divide the first part and if I take actually just throw out 3 from my list, still I am not going to lose anything. So, you can take that none of them 3. So, therefore, this q i is the cannot be of the form uh, 4 n plus 3. Therefore, all these q i's they are going to be of the form because the only class which remains is the 4 n plus 1. So, all the q i's they belongs to 4 n plus 1. Now, you take two element from 4 n plus 1. So, let us say q 1 q i is equal to 4 k i plus 1 for i equal to 1 and 2 for some k i belongs to n. Then q 1 q 2 this is going to be 16 k 1 k 2 plus 4 k 1 plus 4 k 2 plus uh, plus 1. So, this is uh, this is going to be again of the form 4 L plus 1. So, therefore, what is going to happen is that q 1, q 2, this is going to be 4 k plus 1. So, you keep on multiplying it, you will land up in 4 k plus 1, but here your p is of belongs to 4 k plus 4 n plus 3. Therefore, there is, so this cannot have a, this will imply that p cannot have prime factorization which is a contradiction to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So, therefore, for uh, this is contradiction to the fact that we have assumed that 4 n plus 3 contains finitely many. So, this in implies 4 n plus 3 contains infinitely many primes. So, let us uh, ask ourselves, okay. so this is this contains this class contains infinitely many prime, what about 4 n plus 1. So, in the next lecture, we will address this question, which would not be as trivial as 4 n plus 3. Thank you.